Hello, a very warm good evening to all of you and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IES. Welcome to another session of Target Prelims 2023, which is going to be the first session for Environment and Ecology. Already in our program for Target Prelims 2023, we have covered the portions of economy as well as polity in quite significant detail. From today onwards, we will initiate the discussion for environment and ecology, which oftentimes is considered to be quite important in making a difference in your prelim score. So over the span of the next three sessions, we shall be delving upon certain important portions of current affairs which have been in relevance for the past year or maybe even past couple of years, but which is important for your examination perspective. Overall, during these three sessions, we shall be focusing upon certain select areas, certain select topics and portions from where questions are repeatedly asked. So if you analyze the previous year questions and if you try to find a trend that from where are the questions frequently asked and repeated when it comes to the portions of current affairs, you can basically think about it that in the current affairs portion or what can be considered as the dynamic portion, dynamic portion, we can segment it out into various categories. For example, we have international organizations, international organizations and conventions. So from here, necessarily, you will find one or the other question definitely to be asked, be it about the funding mechanism, be it about if there has been a conference of parties meeting which has been held. All these questions are significantly asked from this area. Then also from the portion of current affairs because various aspects of pollution, they oftentimes are in use. So pollution, then national legislations which have been amended or various government schemes which have been brought about. For example, the Amrit Dharohar scheme, for example, when we talk about the Mishti scheme or even the amendments which have been made to the Wildlife Act, the amendments which have been made to the E-Waste Management Act, all those are also important. So the second stage or the second compartmentalization that we can carry out can be for government schemes. And pollution. And then eventually, the third compartmentalization that we can do is of protected areas which have been in use. And the species which have been in use. So these are typically your key focus areas which are asked by UPSC. Now any kind of question from the area of current affairs can be put into each of them or either one of them. For example, if a question is asked about Ramsar sites, then that comes under this particular portion. If a question is asked about Convention on Biological Diversity or UNFCCC, that can be put under this category. So accordingly, we shall hold our discussion. So today's discussion shall be centered around international organizations and conventions. And tomorrow, we shall be discussing about the protected areas, some parts of pollution and some part of the governmental legislations as well. Now, as we start or initiate the discussion, we shall be talking about what can be the relevant answer and why that is the relevant answer. What are the nuances that you have to pick up when you are reading a particular question so that you don't commit silly mistakes and you don't achieve negative marks in that. And you will also be able to uh, put your own answer by the method of poll. And we shall try to make this session as interactive as possible, whereby any questions that you have in between, we shall try to address those questions as well periodically. So without further ado, let us initiate the discussion and let us initiate from the first topic, which is going to refer to the portion of Tiger Census. Now recently, we celebrated 50 years of Project Tiger in our country and that was the occasion when we released the Tiger Census, giving us an idea about the Tiger population as of 2022. So here, this question is based upon that. Now, with reference to the Tiger Census recently in news, consider the following statements. Now, it is a biennial exercise carried out by NTCA, 
National Tiger Conservation Authority to provide an exact count of the tiger population in India. Second statement. The launch of Project Tiger in 1973 paved the way for the conduction of the first tiger census across the country. The third statement. India now accounts for more than 70% of the global tiger population and M stripes and cataract are the tools which help in measuring the tiger population in India. So here we have to find out which of the statements are correct. Now when it comes to tiger census, there is a significant role and a pivotal role played by NTCA. Now when you think about NTCA, it is a statutory body, it is a statutory organization. That again is something you should keep in mind. Now is it a biennial exercise? Biennial means something which is carried out every two years. But that is not the case. When we talk about the tiger count and the tiger population, it is something which is carried out every four years. So this is going to be incorrect because it is carried out every four years. Now, when was this initiated? The Tiger Census was initiated in 2006 when you had the census which told us that the numbers of tiger or the tiger population in the wild has reduced to around 1411, 1411 odd individuals that we find spread across the country. So since that point of time, 2006, 2010, 14, 18 and 22, so you have had the conduction of this census since 2006 onwards. So the launch of Project Tiger in 1973 paved the way for conduction of the first census. This is also going to be incorrect. Then India now accounts for more than 70% of the global tiger population. This is going to be correct. Overall our tiger population has increased substantially. We'll take a look at the population numbers as well. We'll take a look at the regions as well and the various tiger reserves as well after we come across and after we solve this question. Then M stripes and cataract. Now these are mechanisms or mobile applications and also AI based tools which help us ensure a veracity in terms of tiger population which helps us ensure that there is no double counting which is done and there is a substantial amount of authenticity that you can associate with the tiger population so 4 is also going to be correct here so the correct answer in this case is going to be C that is 3 and 4 only I hope most of you would have got this portion as correct. But nonetheless, when we take a look at the tiger census in general, here you have to understand that status of tigers in India, it is being measured since 2006 onwards. Now here you will observe that in 2006, 14, 11, the number of tigers and 2022, this has increased to a whopping 3,167. However, having said that, from the period of the last census, if you consider the last census period, it was spanning between 2014 to 2018. That was the period of last census. Now, during that period of time, the growth in tiger population, the growth was roughly around 30% and more. And this time, in this census population or in this census period, if you consider, that is 2018 to 2022. Here, in this time period, the growth has been around 6%. So the growth has been there, but there has been a significant amount of dip in the growth rate. Now, why do you think that is the case? Even despite of the fact that we have declared close to around many more tiger reserves in the meanwhile, if we think about the number of tiger reserves that we have in India, what is the number that we have? We have close to around 53 tiger reserves in our country as of now. But still you will find that the growth in population is not very significant. That is attributed to various factors such as you have fragmentation of habitat which has happened. Various different tiger range areas, they have been reduced in terms of size and tiger is a solitary animal whereby it will require significant amount of area on its own. It cannot be a situation where in a 100 square kilometer area you can fit in 20 tigers and you have the expectation that if humans can survive, you can also survive. That kind of logic doesn't fly here. So that is why 
each male or each individual adult tiger will require its own space of close to around 80 to 90 square kilometer. And in that aspect, if there is a threat to the biodiversity in terms of its habitat, the population won't be increasing. And that is the expectation going ahead in the future as well. That now the population of tigers are going to stagnate significantly. It is not going to keep on increasing exponentially. We will never reach a situation where we have the elephant population in thousands. We cannot have that. So that is why it is going to have a limited growth rate from now on. Having said that, a few facts which are important and relevant for your examination. So how this census is carried out and who carries out this census? From here you can have various different types of questions which can be twisted, which can be asked. So the National Tiger Conservation Authority in collaboration with the state forest department, various NGOs who do the ground level work as well as the Wildlife Institute of India. So here you have to keep in mind that Wildlife Institute of India in the guidance of NTCA as well as the state forest department. You can always get a question framed that whether IUCN carries this out or not or WWF carries this out or not. So there you have to understand that who carries out this particular census. Then it is carried out every four years. And what is CATRAT and M stripes? So CATRAT stands for Camera Trap Data Repository and Analysis Tool. So what is a camera trap? So camera traps, these are basically installed and these are fixated in the various trees and other places in the forested area. And as soon as there is any motion in front of them, immediately a picture is clicked. And that is how we are able to get an idea about the number of tigers which are there. But there also, you can have an issue of duplication. You can have double counting which can be carried out because it is very difficult to spot individual tiger population separately. So that is why CATRAT makes use of artificial intelligence and neural network models in order to avoid the duplication which has been carried out or which is being carried out in any particular place. And when we talk about M stripes, M stripes is monitoring system for tiger intensive protection and ecological status. Now here it uses GPS data in order to geotag where a particular image has been taken, where a particular tiger has been found. So if another multiple number of tigers have been found in the same region, there is some fallacy which lies in the data because tigers will require their own larger individual areas. Now here oftentimes as a candidate, the immediate amount of attraction is that we should learn all the tiger reserves in the country. But ideally that should not be done because if you take a look at it, we have more than 50 individual tiger reserves, around 53 tiger reserves have been declared across the country. So it is not humanly possible for all of you to learn all the tiger reserves, to learn significant amount of elephant reserves, wildlife sanctuaries, national parks, Ramsar sites, biodiversity hotspots. If you start learning all of them, the numbers will exceed into 800, 900, which is simply inhumane or to expect out of yourself as well. So ideally, if you even want to take a look at the various different tiger reserves, what should be done is state-wise analysis. So state-wise tiger population should be looked into. Now here, and the tiger number of tiger reserves that you have, that should be looked into. So those particular states which have a greater number of tiger reserves, those should be emphasized. For example, here, let's say if you consider the state of either Mizoram or if you consider the state of Jharkhand. Now in both these states you have one individual tiger reserve and in both these tiger reserves since the last census itself the tiger population has not been found in significant and substantial portion. So always these kinds of reserves should never be emphasized into. In Jharkhand for example you have Palamu Tiger Reserve in the region of Mizoram, you have the Dampa. Then in when we talk about West Bengal, you have two tiger reserves, Sundarbans and Buxa. Buxa in the northern part of West Bengal again has never or in the past couple of census has not shown a promising result in terms of tiger population. So with this approach, ideally you should focus on the number of tiger reserves which are in Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, 
Karnataka, Tamil Nadu and Rajasthan. These are significant number. Now, recently, there have been declaration of newer areas of protection in the northern portion of Uttar Pradesh as well. So that is again something that you can take a look into. Now, why I say that Karnataka and Madhya Pradesh, they are of particularly greater importance is that in absolute numerical terms as well, these are the states combinedly, if you consider them, they have one of the largest population of tigers in one particular region. So that is the approach that you can follow. Okay. Now, moving on to another question, very much related to this particular topic itself. Consider the following landscapes of the country. Shivalik Gangetic Plains, the Eastern Ghats, the Western Ghats, Northeastern Hills and Brahmaputra Flood Plains and Sundarbans. Which amongst the above are the habitats where we can find the tiger population in existence? That means which of them can be considered to be natural habitats? Now here, Natural habitat in itself. Natural habitats of tigers. So what is it that the tigers require? They would require a kind of a tropical deciduous forest. It can be moist deciduous. It can be dry deciduous. In both these cases, tiger population will be found. Tropical deciduous. So this ranges from regions which receive around 140-150 cm of rainfall annually to even around 70-60 cm rainfall annually, you will find these particular type of vegetation. So you can find the tiger population there. Then grasslands and shrublands. Generally, what you find in the case of open forests, right? Now, what do we mean when we talk about open forest? Open forests are those kinds of forests where the canopy cover is less than 10%. What is a canopy cover? So for any tree that you have, let's say this is a tree or an area of vegetation. Now, this is what is referred to as the canopy and the canopy cover. So here when we talk about the open forest, these have a canopy cover in that area to be less than 10%. Canopy cover less than 10%. So in those areas also, you will find a substantial amount of tiger population. So here, when we talk about the various options, Shivalik Gangetic Plains, significant amount of tiger population you will find there. You have in the entire Shivalik Gangetic Plains, you have many of them from Pilbhit to Dudwa to Rajaji. Many of the tiger reserves are situated in this. Eastern Ghats, all along the Eastern Ghats also you will find tiger population all along the region of Andhra Pradesh, then northwestern part of Tamil Nadu, the portions of Telangana, Odisha, that is the portion. Then Western Ghats, significant amount of population both in the region of Madhya Pradesh as well as as soon as you enter into the Western Ghat region of Karnataka, there also from Anshi, Dandeli, to Bhadra, you will have many tiger reserves in that area as well. Northeastern hills and Brahmaputra flood plains, Assam, significant amount of tiger population and Sundarbans, that is considered to be the home of the Royal Bengal tiger. So in this case, D, that is all of them, or rather C in fact, that is 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5, all of them will be considered to be the perfect habitat where you can find the tiger population. I hope most of you have given the correct answer and yes, majority of you have given the correct answer in this particular case. Now, moving on to the next question. With reference to the Kunming Montreal Agreement in news recently, consider the following statement. Now, Kunming Montreal Agreement has been in news for the past few months because of the various different declarations and the objectives and the goal setting which has been done here. So whenever you have such kind of an agreement based on environment, based on any particular goal setting, UPSC is not necessarily going to ask you a direct question about it, that what this agreement was, but 
from the spin off areas or from the individual goal setting which has been done you can always expect an individual or couple of questions so it was finalized at the 15th conference of parties to the convention on biological diversity to remove the issue of conflict of interest the agreement aims to seek financing from the governments and the ngos only conflict of interest in terms of financing whether you have your own personal stake involved in this or not then global environment facility provides the funding for the un convention on biological diversity so out of this we have to find out which of them are correct so the first statement it was finalized at the 15 cop yes then to remove the issue of conflict of interest is it going to seek funding only from the governments and ngos no and this is one of the major points or one of the major factors which has been decided in this kunming montreal agreement so this is going to be incorrect statement and this was the catch here in this entire particular question if you manage to eliminate two automatically you will reach the correct answer wherever two is present eliminate that and you will reach the correct answer the gef provides the funding for the un convention on biological diversity absolutely yes so here one and three that is going to be the correct answer now here very briefly to make ourselves familiar with this particular agreement first of all you also have to understand the basics of cbd so convention on biological diversity or cbd this was arrived at when in 1992 at the rio summit rio summit now here this cbd is funded by gef gef now for any convention in general whenever you have any kind of climatic convention or any kind of international convention which is arrived at you will generally observe a kind of protocol which follows it now what is the difference between each of them oftentimes we get confused between what is a convention and what is a protocol you will hear about Kyoto protocol Montreal protocol you will hear all of these terms so what is the difference between these two understand it in very simple terms when we talk about convention it always refers to a larger objective it always talks about achieving a larger objective but it does not set in place any kind of set targets any kind of framework about how to achieve that objective so in order to have that fixed time frame in order to have that fixed guideline about how to achieve that objective you have the initiation of protocols think about it for example you can take the analogy let's suppose all of you decide something that few of you get together that we will prepare for civil services examination now when you will clear it or what is your time scale when you will finish the portion in which year will you appear for general studies in which year will you be able to finalize the portion of optional you have not decided anything you have set a larger objective i will clear the civil services examination that can be referred to as the convention right and let's suppose after a few days all of you then decide to sit together that we have set an objective but we have not defined any particular goal so you set to uh, sit together and then you decide that in two months let's say we'll complete the revision etc etc now that is where you do an individual goal setting a time frame setting so that will be the protocol to the convention okay so generally you will find the case of protocols and conventions you will find that when we talk about vienna convention now what that vienna convention refers to in terms of environment not in terms of diplomatic immunity when we talk about vienna convention it deals with which particular issue it talks about correct it basically talks about ozone layer right now this convention met in 1985 
to talk about the fact that ozone hole has to be patched up and there has to be something which needs to be done in order to patch up the ozone hole but to follow it up with a kind of set guidelines you require the Montreal protocol and this year even Montreal protocol is relevant because as per the latest reports there has been indication that the ozone hole has been healing quite sufficiently well then after that here, when we come to Convention to Biological Diversity, it had set itself three major objectives. Three objectives were set up. What were the three objectives? So it had three objectives. The objectives were, first of all, the conservation of biodiversity in broader terms. Conserve biodiversity. Then after that, sustainable use of biodiversity sustainable use means without causing any damage to the local vicinity biodiversity that you find in that region and third is fair and equitable equitable access and benefit sharing okay now in order to achieve these objectives you had the CBD passing various protocols as well the conference of parties to CBD they passed various protocols so in order to have sustainable use of the products of biodiversity you had a protocol of CBD which is referred to as the Cartagena protocol and then in order to achieve the objective of fair and equitable access and benefit sharing, you had the Nagoya Protocol. And this Nagoya Protocol, at this point of time, you had the setting up of targets. Targets in order to conserve biodiversity and these targets were set up till or to be achieved till 2020 and it was at this point of time where you had the setting of these targets and these were referred to as the HE biodiversity targets now the end date of these target were basically 2020 now what to do after 2020 you need a goal in your life Similarly, the organizations, the various actions, they also need a kind of a goal. So what to do beyond 2020, that needed to be finalized. And we all know that during the time of 2020, we had another major issue, that is the COVID pandemic, due to which the convention or the conference of parties could not be held. That is why this particular Kunming Montreal Agreement is much more relevant, much more important, because this Kunming Montreal Agreement, that paves the way for the global biodiversity framework and target setting up till 2030 and the larger goal to be achieved up till 2050 as well. Okay, so here that is what you should know in the background when you talk about this particular agreement. Now, in order to achieve these objectives and in order to adhere to the particular objectives and the missions of CBD, India also passed a national legislation in order to adhere to the demands and that national legislation also has the same three objectives which is that national legislation which has been passed by the country let me see if we are aware so in order to achieve that we had the biodiversity act very good biodiversity act 2002 this was passed in order to achieve the goals and the target set by CBD now here the goal set by this agreement if you take a look at it halt in human induced extinction increasing area of natural ecosystems by 2050 so that is a long-term goal maintaining the genetic diversity sustainably restoring the ecosystems fair and equitable sharing of benefits from genetic resources and 
aligning financial flows with the global biodiversity framework, the 2050 vision. Now this financial flows, it is here that multinationals and multinational companies, they have been fixed a particular kind of accountability. So for the multinationals, what has been described is that now you have to maintain transparency that in your production process, in the transportation of the products that you manufacture, is the local biodiversity getting impacted or not? If yes, you have to communicate it to the audience and to the consumers as well so that the consumers, they also make a smart and sustainable choice at the end of it all. So that is where the multinationals have been roped in and the financing from them also has been sought because after all the financing which has been received, which is being received rather, that is particularly limited. And the funding for the financing as of now is carried out by Global Environment Facility. But that is where countries like India, they demanded at this conference of parties that look, the funding is not equitable, the funding is very haphazard and irregular. So either set a special trust fund under CBD to help the various countries conserve biodiversity or reform GEF. But that could not be taken to its logical conclusion and the next conference of parties is supposed to deal with this particular issue. Now here, some of the major goals that you will observe, which needs to be looked at from your prelims perspective, to bring the loss of areas of high biodiversity importance close to zero by 2030. Then you also have the 30 by 30 goal. What is this 30 by 30 goal? So when we talk about Kunming Montreal, all of us, we know only about 30 by 30 goal, but that is just one part of it. This is to bring 30% of area, area of the planet under conservation by 2030. So that is the 30 by 30 goal. You will bring those many areas under protected system and protected network. Halt human induced extinction to bring to a stop of it. And impact of invasive alien species. So that impact has to be reduced. Impact to be reduced. by 30 per or by 50 percent rather by 2030 okay so these particular targets need to be looked at for your prelims in significantly greater detail okay now reduce pollution risk and minimize the impact of climate change these are also some of the other targets which have been defined. Now, these are very, very similar. If you look at the HE biodiversity targets, there also the goals overall are very similar. Here, you have a kind of a fixed quantification of the goal. 30 by 30 by 50 percent to zero. So that quantification has happened. Otherwise, the goals have largely remained unchanged from the case of HE target setting up till 2020. Now, Consider the following statements with reference to the International Big Cat Alliance, an initiative to protect the wild population of big cat species. Now here, International Big Cat Alliance is an initiative launched by India in order to conserve the big cat population. So the countries with the natural ranges of big cats shall only be considered to be the members of this alliance. Okay. The funding for the conservation shall be provided by Global Environment Facility with World Bank being the trustee. Now, read very carefully because here you have to find out which of the above statements are incorrect. Now, incorrect has to be found out. So that is where majority of us, we commit a mistake in this. So here, the first statement, countries with the natural ranges of big cats shall only, whenever you have such absolute wording which is there, 
most of the times 90 to 95 percent of the cases that is incorrect so this is going to be incorrect because various different NGOs interested parties who are willing to share the best practices for conservation of big cats all of them can also be inculcated or included as members now the funding for conservation who will provide the funding now in the initial five-year period India is supposed to provide that funding and after five years it is expected that the natural awareness programs the various fundraising programs which will be launched across the entirety of the globe that will be able to sustain the funding requirements for this big cat alliance so GEF with World Bank that is not going to provide the funding here so here here you have to find out which is incorrect so the answer is C that is both one and two both of them are absolutely incorrect so again majority of you have given the correct answer but many of you have given the incorrect as well so here that is something to be looked at that India has pledged to launch or proposed to launch the global alliance and the guaranteed funding of hundred million dollars initially that will be provided by India so none of the global agencies that you will come across which you will be confused with in the option none of the global agencies will be involved for that funding mechanism and here proposed mega global alliance for the protection of the seven major big cats so you should be aware of these seven major big cats also tiger lion leopard snow leopard puma jaguar and cheetah all of them will be sought to be protected under this now another factor that you need to know about this alliance is going to be the governance structure now the governance structure is again something from where questions can be twisted around so it is going to have a general assembly then just like in the case of United Nations has got a general assembly with all the members being able to participate here also you will have a general assembly a council of at least seven but not more than 15 member countries elected by the General Assembly for a term of five years and upon the recommendation of the council which is formed thereby the General Assembly will appoint a secretary general for a given denoted specific term period as well so again this is one of those trivias that you need to know for your examination okay now after that with the reference to the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, consider the following statements. Recently, India amended the Wildlife Act 1972 to adhere to the norms provided by CITES. Appendix 1 species are provided with maximum protection and no trade is allowed for the species listed in it. India has hosted only one conference of parties meeting to the sites held annually since the inception of the convention. We have to find out which of them are the correct statement overall. So here the first statement, India amended the Wildlife Act. So the latest amendment, Wildlife Amendment 2022, has been amended in order to provide a separate schedule for all the various species listed under this particular convention. So that is going to be the correct statement. Appendix 1 species are provided with maximum protection and no trade is allowed. This is going to be incorrect because trade is allowed here only if you have to carry out trade for research, developmental purposes and other activities related to research. Only then in that situation can you carry out the trade. And there also you have to keep in mind that the exporting country that has to bear the responsibility that the species will be safe and the species will be unharmed. So that is going to be incorrect. So trade under regulated conditions can be allowed. India has hosted only one COP, that is correct, held annually, this is incorrect. So India hosted the conference of parties to sites only once and that was in 1981. And this conference of parties is not held annually. The conference of parties to United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change or UNFCCC, that is held annually. Sites, the conference of parties is held every two to three years. Held every 
two to three years. Okay, so the third statement is also going to be incorrect. So the correct statement is going to be C, that is one only. Now here when we talk about sites, here again you have to understand that sites also was an out was actually formed much earlier and sites for the first time the agreement was arrived at way back in 1973. Now this was an outcome of what is referred to as the mother of all conferences held for nature and that is the Stockholm conference. Stockholm conference 1972. So here CITES was arrived at in 1973. It was finally promulgated and ratified by 1975 when it came into force. And since that point of time, conference of parties are being held every two to three years. Now here, you will find that the species are listed into three different appendices. So you have appendix one species appendix 1 here you have maximum protection then in 2 you have regulated trade which can be carried out where a species is endangered or threatened in one of the areas now these species which are listed in appendix 2 they are not immediately at the verge of extinction but they would benefit significantly if conservation is carried out so those are listed in appendix 2 and appendix 3 when we talk about these talks about those species which is endangered let's say in one of the member countries or the member parties in those areas if any of the species is endangered or in any of the species is threatened in those areas they are put under appendix 3 in all these cases one thing you have to keep in mind is the exporting nation is held responsible nation is held responsible for what it is held responsible for the safety of the organism and that is where you need a kind of a management authority for these exporting nations as well so it is in order to inculcate these that the wildlife act 1972 has been amended now sites has been in news recently most of us would be aware of that because you had the conference of parties 19 which was held in Panama this was also referred to as the world wildlife conference overall now here a decision was taken in order to include sea cucumbers and this was a kind of a move which was backed by various countries like Australia and so on. So in this sea cucumber has been put under appendix 2. The utility of sea cucumber will take a look at it shortly. So that has been put under appendix 2. India had also submitted a couple of suggestions to be included. One of them included the shisham tree, the deciduous tree to be included in appendix 2 and the other was about a tortoise species that is Batagor Kachuga. So they also the request was to include it under the portion of appendix 2 because there also significant amount of trade is happening and smuggling is happening in both these cases. Now here that is why it has been in relevance that is something you should be aware of. Now coming on to the next question. With reference to the pH levels of oceanic waters consider the following statements. The pH level of oceanic water is reducing at an alarming rate due to increased CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. The species of clownfish are unable to locate the predators due to increased acidification of the oceans. Sea cucumbers are vital to help control the acidification of oceans through their excretions that they carry out. The increased CO2 absorption shall benefit the growth of coral reefs by increasing the rate of photosynthesis. Now here, if we take a look at these statements, the first statement, pH level is reducing at an alarming rate, that is correct. 
pH level is reducing means it is becoming acidic. By the way, as of now, when we talk about the acidification and ocean acidification is all that we hear in terms of climate change. The pH value of ocean as of now, is it above 7 or is it below 7? What do you think? What is the pH value? Is the oceanic water acidic as of now or is it basic as of now? Let me know. Then the species of clownfish are unable to locate the predators due to increased acidification. That is also correct. Yes, most of you have given the correct answer for acidic or basic. But many of you have given a very incorrect answer. So as of now, the pH of the oceanic waters, that is 8.1. So oceanic waters are still basic or alkaline in nature. When we talk about acidification, the pH value is decreasing by the rate of 0 0.1, 0 0.05 like that. But the rate of decrease or the rate of decline has been very substantial. So never mistake this with the fact that the oceanic waters are acidic as of now. They are alkaline. They are turning acidic. Then sea cucumbers are vital to help control the acidification. Yes because they carry out secretion of significant amount of alkaline salts and increased CO2 absorptions shall benefit the growth of coral reefs by increased photosynthesis. This is going to be incorrect because when we have the ocean acidification taking place and happening, you have to understand that it makes the oceanic water devoid of carbonate ions. So the carbonate ions which are very very important. What are carbonate ions? Carbonate ions are this. Right? Now these carbonate ions they are synthesized by the various different calcifying animals and species, shell bearing animals including the corals as well. Now what the corals do is that from the surrounding water bodies or from the surrounding vicinity water, they will synthesize the carbonate, they will also synthesize the calcium and along with that they are able to make calcium carbonate. And that calcium carbonate is very essential for the manufacturing of those reefs and the reef building which is done as well as for the role played by various different crustaceans and shell bearing animals like you have crabs, lobster, various species of snails etc. So they build a kind of a shell. An ideal example of this is the species of pteropods. Pteropods. Now these pteropods they are also referred to as, for example, what is it referred to or uh, it is referred to as the chips or the potato chips that we consume in our day-to-day -day lives. Pteropods, they solve the same purpose in terms of marine ecosystem and the marine environment because these are consumed by a host of variety of different species as a kind of edible snack items. Now these pteropods, they have a soft or a kind of a small shell around them in which they conceal their soft body structure. With increasing acidification which is happening, the shell building activity that is getting inhibited due to which these pteropods are finding it very difficult to survive which is impacting the entirety of the oceanic food chain as well. So in this case, which is the answer which is going to be correct? You have B, 1, 2 and 3 which are going to be correct here. Okay, majority of you have given the correct answer here. Now, in this case, when we talk about ocean acidification, ocean acidification. Now, few things, a recap of it, which is relevant. As of now, pH is 18 or 8.1. It is alkaline and increased CO2 emission. CO2 emission means what? It means greater absorption let's say this is the oceanic surface greater absorption by oceanic water absorption and when you have greater absorption in water and you don't have any other activities which are going to consume this carbon dioxide 
what happens or what results as a process is that carbonate ions are consumed. Ions are consumed. Not only the shell bearing animals, but even as we take took a look of clownfish, clownfish in their larval stages, they are unable to find a perfect habitat. They are unable to get away from their predators if the water starts turning acidic. So it impacts a wide range of biodiversity in general. But then, this is not the only impact that we have. Increased CO2 emissions means what? Increased greenhouse effect and due to increased greenhouse effect you have increased temperature of the atmosphere now when the atmospheric temperature increases the sea surface temperature or the oceanic temperature also increases increases now overall i hope we are aware that the oceanic waters they act as a sink or an absorber of around 25 to 30 percent of the carbon dioxide which is present so oceanic water turns out to be a kind of a natural sink and the carbon which is absorbed by this oceanic water what is that carbon referred to as we have a classification of carbon you have purple, you have green, you have blue carbon. There is a classification. So the carbon dioxide which is absorbed directly by the oceanic water, that is referred to as what? Blue carbon. Now here you have to understand that when the oceanic temperature increases beyond a point, the ocean is unable to absorb carbon dioxide anymore and the oceanic water they turn out to be net emitters of carbon dioxide. So that is when the oceanic water due to this becomes net emitter of carbon dioxide. net emitters so what this will do this will further feed back the entire loop and give a boost to the entire feedback mechanism that is why increased co2 emission will automatically in a way lead to a situation where the oceanic water becomes very hot is unable to absorb carbon dioxide anymore starts releasing carbon dioxide and the ocean rather than becoming a natural sink becomes a natural emitter of carbon dioxide further exacerbating the problem that we are facing so that is why the carbon dioxide emission needs to be controlled now in one way where we can treat this problem or one of the solutions one of the mechanisms by which we can treat this problem is by iron fertilization iron fertilization of oceans how and what is there to be done in this so basically in this what is done is that small iron filings they are spread over in the oceanic water and when that small iron filings they are spread over those iron filings in the presence of sunlight, they will boost the growth of phytoplanktons. So it boosts the growth of the growth of phytoplanktons. And when you have a significant proportion of phytoplanktons, these significantly help the provision of food for the food chain as well, and they carry out photosynthesis. So, they will absorb CO2 by photosynthesis. So, in this manner, we can end up organically and naturally increasing the absorption quantity and the absorption amount when we talk about oceanic water. What is the volume that they are able to absorb? That can be increased by spraying the oceanic water with these iron filings okay iron filings are basically very small portions or particles of iron which provides the necessary nutrient for the growth of these algal species like phytoplanktons now 
here when we talk about sea cucumber. Now sea cucumber is also relevant in terms of sites because it has been added in the appendix 2 of sites. Now these are echinoderms like you have sea urchins and starfish. These are echinoderms. Now are they to be found across Indian coastline? Yes they can be found across Indian coastline as well. There has been significant amount of cases which have been reported in the recent past about smuggling of sea cucumbers from the Tamil Nadu coastline. So they can be found. They are very similar in terms of shape to your normal cucumber but they have a kind of a locomotive feature where they can move with the help of the feet which can get stuck to the ground. Now these are crucial to the ecosystem. Why? Because they are very important decomposers. And decomposers are important in terms of returning the nutrients back into the system, recycling of the nutrient. So they convert the material, the decomposing organic matter into recyclable nutrients for other marine life. In addition, feeding and excretion by the cucumbers that increases the alkalinity buffering against ocean acidification. So this has been in news because it has been included in Appendix 2. Okay. Now, then the next question. With regards to offshore wind generation, consider the following statements. It is a more reliable energy generation source as compared to onshore wind generation. The Global Offshore Wind Alliance has been initiated by IRENA, that is International Renewable Energy Agency, and the Global Wind Energy Council. So this is about offshore wind generation. So here, the first statement, it is going to be correct. Why? Because what do we mean by offshore wind generation? Offshore wind is something which is happening or the wind generation or the electricity or energy generation capacity which is coming from the areas which are not on the land in the water body. Generally when we talk about offshore centers of wind generation or wind energy generation these are situated many nautical miles into the sea. Now here you have to understand the reasoning behind that. The reasoning is very simple. Let's say we talk about the land area itself. Let's say we talk about the peninsular region. Right. Now here when we talk about the land areas, now the wind pattern that can change. That can change on a daily basis, that can change on a seasonal basis quite frequently. But if you have such a platform, let's say which has been built over the water body, now that platform will have a regular movement of the winds regardless of let's say the magnitude or the intensity of the winds at least the wind movement will be observed whereas in the case of land area that land area might get very heated up might develop a low pressure center high pressure center leading to the change in wind direction significant variation in wind generation and that is a major obstacle that the entire wind generation capacity is facing because installation of this wind uh, power or the generation of electricity by this wind, that is something which is very costly. Installation process is costly and if you don't get the re re desired reliable output, then it is not worth it. That is why people are investing excessively in the kind of solar energy generation, but there you are faced with another incredible problem and that is of solar waste. So here, that is why offshore platforms are relied upon. Now. The Global Offshore Alliance has been initiated by the Denmark-based IRENA and the Global Wind Energy Council. This is also going to be correct. So here the correct answer is going to be C. That is both 1 and 2. Again, very nice to see that majority of you have given the correct answer. So they have launched this particular alliance and that will that alliance aims to increase the wind generation capacity by around 2000 gigawatts by 2050 in order to limit the warming of the planet because we need to switch to renewables even as per India's Panchamrit designated goals which India has set or India had set for itself in Conference of Parties 26 at Glasgow in 2021. There also everybody talked about 
moving towards renewable energy generation. So to reach this target, the aim is to contribute to accelerating growth to reach a total of at least 380 gigawatt of installed capacity by the end of 2030. As of now, the installed capacity is close to around 62 gigawatts only. So the aim is to increase it exponentially. The next question. Now, this is also significantly in news, so this is also very relevant area. Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism is an initiative undertaken by the European Union for which on this particular mechanism will have which of the following outcomes. First, it will ensure the accountability of carbon emissions to the nations under the European Union. Second, higher taxes will be charged from the carbon intensive industries. What do we mean by carbon intensive industries? Which in their methodology and the process of production, they emit a lot of or they release a lot of carbon emissions or carbon based emissions. Now, it will help to eliminate the difference in price paid for the products imported from high emission developing nations and it will hurt countries like India the most as compared to countries like Russia and China. We have to find out the correct statements in this case. So here when we talk about it, so the first ensuring the accountability of carbon emissions to the nations under EU. This is not about the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Then higher taxes will be charged from carbon intensive industries. Absolutely correct. It will help to eliminate the difference in price paid for the products. Absolutely correct. It will hurt India the most. Incorrect. This particular mechanism has been set in order to, in a way, punish Russia and those countries of sorts. Now what this mechanism is about, so the correct answer in this case is going to be B, that is going to be 2 and 3 only. So here many of you have given the incorrect answer. So here when we talk about it, understand what this mechanism is. So this mechanism talks about reducing the overall emission in the world. And how does it seek to achieve that? So the process and the methodology is supposed to be very simple. So here, let's suppose you have a country in Europe. Okay, let's take the case of Germany. We are talking about the logic followed. And then let's say the country like India. Now India is a developing nation which doesn't have that designated target setting for the reduction of carbon emission and so on. So when India will manufacture a product, let's say India manufactures steel. Now that steel is manufactured not with the latest mechanisms, not with the latest emission standards, etc. in place. So that steel will be slightly cheaper. Let's say its price is rupees 90 per ton. Let's assume. Now, in the case of the countries like Germany and other countries of European Union, you have to follow the emission system and the emission norm set in European Union. So you will have to install better equipments, better machineries, better precipitators, better scrubbers, and that will increase the cost of production. So let's suppose the steel produced in Germany, due to the modern equipments, that comes out to be rupees 110. So as of now, under the present mechanism, you have countries like India who will benefit from this particular process as of now in order to have the cheaper products being supplied into the market. So this is sought to be disincentivizing for the countries of the European Union and the production economy in European Union. So in order to counter that, in order to get rid of that kind of an anomaly, what has been done is that those developing nations which don't follow or which don't have the best emission norms etc. There the carbon intensive industries for example fertilizers, iron steel, aluminium. All these different industries have been shortlisted and there will be imposition of significant amount of tax. Tax will be paid when these products enter the region of European Union. So in a way, 
it will outdo any kind of competitive advantage that countries like India have. Now, in India, when we talk about the various products which are going to be impacted, aluminium and iron and steel, these are the major products which are going to be impacted because significant proportion of these products are being exported to European Union. And here, the taxation rate is going to be much higher as compared to the WTO prescribed limit. Just to give you a kind of an uh, example, imagine that as of now, as has been indicated by various different uh, research firms as well, as of now, if the taxation rate, let's say, is around 2 to 3% on the products crossing the border, in the situation where CBAM becomes active, in that situation, post-CBAM, post-CBAM, the tax rate will be increased to a whopping 25 to 28%. So you can imagine the cost implication for the various products. So that is why various different countries like India, they have been protesting about it. In the recently held Conference of Parties 27 to the UNFCCC, this was one of the major agendas which was discussed and obviously a solution could not be reached at. That is why this becomes important. Now here, if you observe the various different countries which are going to be impacted, observe that countries like Russia, China, Turkey, these are going to be impacted significantly because here you will observe that iron, steel, fertilizer, electricity production or aluminium or cement, anything which is carbon intensive will be taxed when it reaches European borders. India is going to suffer significantly but India is going to suffer only in terms of iron and steel as well as aluminium okay and the various different analysis of this particular mechanism also points to the fact that this is largely to punish countries like Russia because the impact of this tax in terms of ensuring better climatic condition ensuring better emission that is very negligible because the countries rather than now exporting to Europe they will bypass it from various different transshipment hubs across the country across the entirety of the world and this can always be flouted off now that was about the carbon border adjustment mechanism now we come to the portion of carbon leakage now Carbon leakage is a term used to describe which of the following. So here, what is carbon leakage? Lack of proper scrutiny leading to increased emissions by the nations. Carbon emissions caused by anthropogenic activities having a devastating impact on the nearby eco-sensitive zones. What is carbon leakage? Undermining the global efforts to combat climate change by transfer of production centers and D, the excess emissions of carbon compounds which slowly begin to accumulate in the upper atmosphere as it leaks. So which of them can be ascribed as carbon leakage? I'll give you 20 seconds. Let us see. Uh, in the meanwhile, I'll take a question. Suraj, why did India oppose this in COP27? It is going to benefit India. No. India's iron and steel and aluminium industry that is going to be impacted quite severely. So that is why and all the other products that India has been manufacturing, it the entire move is going to turn the entire European economy into a kind of a protectionist economy. That is why countries like India have been opposing this. So in this, the correct answer is going to be C undermining the global efforts to combat climate change by transfer of the production process. So here I see majority of you have given the incorrect answer. So when we talk about carbon leakage, what is it? Let us understand that. So as per the various different international protocols and agreements for climate change, various different countries, industrial countries, etc., they have been designated and there has been a target which has been set that you cannot emit beyond that. Now, what the countries are doing, so let's say when we talk about, first of all, the targets, targets for emission. Now, these targets for controlling emission, these are set for developed nations. 
developing nations they have been asked to voluntarily contribute to reducing the emission there has not been a target that has been set and which is the principle involved in this process that the developing nations have not been designed or designated a fixed target but the developed nations have been that is what is referred to as CBDR that is common but differentiated responsibility common but differentiated responsibility now it is as per this that developing nations have been given a kind of a relaxation now what do countries do let's suppose we consider the country for today is Germany we'll take the example of Germany always so let's say let's assume Germany has been set a target that you cannot emit more than assume 100 tons of CO2 now Germany has got various different automotive productions automatic automotive factories various different uh, coal mines and thermal power stations also are present in Germany now let's say Germany knows that it won't be able to fulfill its target and if it wants to fulfill its target it will have to compromise on its economic setup so what very cleverly various countries have been doing is they have been shifting the production silently into the developing nation let's say Bangladesh now Bangladesh doesn't have any kind of a set parameter or any kind of a set target so there they can continue to emit endlessly no cap on emission now due to this what is happening emission is happening but emission is not being done by Germany so it is kind of, kind of finding a loophole in the entire target setting process so that is where carbon leakage is referred to that you are leaking carbon into the atmosphere but you are doing it in a manner to circumvent the provisions of the carbon targets which have been set as per the various conventions and protocol okay so that is the aspect of leakage then we come to mission life so when we talk about mission life so with reference to mission life consider the following statements so here it was introduced by India at conference of parties 27 to the UNFCCC then it seeks to launch a movement of P3 that is pro-planet people nudging the rest of the world for a sustainable living actions such as water harvesting are not included in this as it seeks to combat the problems of pollution so take around 10-20 seconds think about it and in that meantime I will take uh, some question so uh, Raghu what if all countries stop exporting carbon intensive things to European Union that will boost the local production in European Union it will always be advantageous okay right now about this particular question so the first statement it was introduced at COP 27 in Egypt no it was introduced in COP 26 and that was held at Glasgow okay it seeks to launch a movement of P3 people P3 that is pro planet people that is going to be correct actions such as water harvesting are not included in this as it seeks to combat the problem of pollution that is incorrect so even water harvesting so when we talk about sustainability in lifestyle that is targeted by mission life so here sustainable consumption will lead to sustainable production and then sustainable policy making that is sought to be done here so sustainable consumption also means conserving water keeping your air conditioners at 24 degrees Celsius so that it doesn't heat up the environment significantly and here you had to find out the incorrect statements rather than the correct statements so which are going to be incorrect that is going to be a 1 and 3 only so here again majority of you have given the incorrect answer in that case so understand that it is going to be 
A. Now, the three pillars of mission life which you have to understand is basically what is revolve, going to revolve around. These are also referred to as the three pillars of mission life. So you can have questions from this also. So what are those three pillars? Changing demand. Changing demand will come how? By using sustainably. This is about sustainable use. Okay. Sustainable use. Now this sustainable use means lesser utilization of electricity and electrical equipments, better utilization, judicious utilization of water. Now uh, utilization of those products which are biodegradable, environmentally friendly. Now if you do that, it will lead to a change in the supply system and the supply ecosystem because now the producers will be nudged or forced to produce only those sustainable items and each of them can then influence the policy let's say disincentivizing the utility or usage of petrol and diesel cars and incentivizing the usage of electric vehicles or hydrogen vehicles so that is a policy measure bringing about a single use plastic ban epr responsibilities for e-waste etc all those will be policy measures so all of that will come into play together in order to improve sustainability so that is the portion of mission life okay Pro-planet people here, when we talk about it, uh, Soma, that is referring to those particular people who are changing their utility or demand is changed by them. For example, let's say normal individuals, they are using the products much more sustainably. They are not using plastic bags. They are not uh, generating enough heat by air conditioners. They are recycling the waters. So those will be categorized under pro-planet people. Okay. Uh, cooktop uh, to be used in households and help in reducing carbon emission yes so that was also cooktop was also uh, launched during the uh, G20 summit meetings which are being held so it was launched in February now that cooktop talks about the utility of solar energy it talks about the utilization of that particular cooking mechanism even in isolated areas where you don't have the developed infrastructure for gas supply etc so it will uh, definitely be reducing the emissions especially the indoor pollution will be controlled by that okay now next question Consider the following statements for Global Environment Facility. It was created as a result of the Stockholm Conference 1972 in order to provide funding for the environment activities. Provides funding only for the conventions of Rio, for example, CBD, Convention to Combat Desertification and UNFCCC. Which of the statements is or are correct? So here when we talk about the first statement so it was created as a result of stockholm conference 1972 what do you think will that be the correct answer in this case no then provides funding only for the conventions of rio here also you have an absolute statement that is used or absolute word that is used that is only so this is going to be incorrect so it provides funding to other organizations as well we'll take a look into that so which of them is or are correct so here none of them are correct so the answer is going to be d neither one nor two so good a majority of you have given the correct answer so here when we talk about gef gef was a result a result of rio conference Earth Summit 1992 which was held in Rio. Now, initially when this was formed, when this was provided for, it talked about the funding to Convention on Biological Diversity that is CBD that we just discussed as well as UNFCCC framework convention on climate change 2003 onwards united nation Con convention to combat desertification or uncd 
was also included in the funding aspect or the ambit of GEF. Now GEF has got World Bank as the trustee. As the trustee of the fund. And here other than these three conventions which were arrived at the Rio summit, this also is able to provide funding for activities under Stockholm Convention. Now Stockholm Convention is for what? This was arrived at in 2001. This is for POPs, Persistent Organic Pollutants. Persistent organic pollutants and also for Minamata, Basel as well as funding is also provided for Montreal protocol for ozone depletion under this itself. So it provides funding for various different mechanisms and various different conventions. Here one thing you have to keep in mind, if you want to learn this up, if you are trying to learn this up, don't start learning individual of these organizations, individuals of these protocols where the GEF is providing funding for. In that case you will always end up confusing uh, between them and you will commit a mistake. Ideally understand when it has been formed. So Earth Summit 1992. Earth Summit three different conventions were arrived at. So provides funding to all of them. Other than that Stockholm, Basel and Montreal. These are also receiving funding from GEF. Now most of the cases of GEF funding when you uh, talk about it. It talks about sustainability in general. For example in India if you talk about the funding provided in India. In India, GEF funds various programs such as Green Agriculture, Green AG, also one of the very relevant programs that is Secure Himalayas. Now this is in order to restore and conserve the Himalayan landscape and the Himalayan habitat in general. And that is where snow leopards, they are used as an indicator species in order to always have a reference that what is the condition of the Himalayan habitat. So GEF provides funding to these kind of mechanisms, these kinds of programs. Surprisingly, in the entire aspect or objective setting of GEF, there is one exception in terms of objective which naturally does not occur to the candidates when they hear about GEF and that is where many questions can be framed which will force you to commit a mistake. So one of the objectives of GEF is also to improve improve gender equity or rather to remove gender inequality. So this is one of those objectives of GEF which is not oftentimes stressed upon and that is where you are prone to committing mistakes. You will be very very uh, tempted to commit a mistake in this case because when you think about environment normally gender equality doesn't come into picture. So that is something you have to keep in mind. Okay. Then Consider the following statements for Stockholm plus 50. Now Stockholm plus 50 recently held in order to commemorate something. So was held in Stockholm, Sweden and co-hosted by Rwanda. Sustainable recovery from COVID-19 pandemic was included in the agenda of Stockholm plus 50. It celebrated 50 years of the Stockholm conference 1972. So here which of the following statements are correct. So in this case, the first statement that you observe that was held in Stockholm, Sweden and co-hosted by Rwanda. This is incorrect. It was co-hosted by Kenya. Okay. Sustainable recovery from COVID-19 pandemic was included in the agenda. That is going to be correct. It celebrated 50 years of the Stockholm conference 1972. That is also going to be correct. So that is where Stockholm plus 50 
was held and it commemorated the various achievements which have been had or achieved in those 50 years. So here B 2 and 3 only is going to be correct. If you were able to eliminate Rwanda automatically, you could have reached the correct answer. Good to see that majority of you, you have reached the correct answer. Now in this situation, I would always advise you that it is normally very, very difficult in order to learn all the various conferences, all the various conventions, etc. I would always advise you to have a kind of a timeline, a chronology, as it is said, is always going to be helpful. So I will provide you here with a kind of a timeline along the times of along the lines of Stockholm conference, which will help you retain this for a longer period. So for example, it all started, the entire aspect can be thought about to be to have started in 1971. Now what happened in 1971? You had the Ramsar conference and the Ramsar list, the Ramsar convention was arrived at. Then 1972 you had the very famous Stockholm conference. It is in this Stockholm conference as a result of this it was held on 5th of June. That is why 5th of June is celebrated as the World Environment Day. Now here this Stockholm conference identified the triple threats to the mankind. Identify triple threats. What were those triple threats? And these triple threats were talked about even in Stockholm plus 50. So triple threats faced by mankind was climate change, which was talked about. Then pollution and also loss of biodiversity. Okay. These were the triple threats which were faced and which were identified. Then you can think about it that 1973 you had sites which was arrived at. Then there was an interregnum, a gap. Then in 1987 you had the Brundtland report which was published based on the discussions of the Stockholm conference because the Stockholm conference also talked about sustainability in general. Sustainability. So you had Brundtland report which was finalized. This talked about sustainable development. For the first time, sustainable development was defined as what it is. That definition was provided here. Then 1988, you had the setting up of IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. IPCC was set up. Now this IPCC was a scientific body which talked about the evidences, the real research and the real findings which indicated to climate change etc. That was done by IPCC. 1990, you had the first assessment report by IPCC. Report by IPCC. Now it was in this report where significant amount of alarm was raised that the world is indeed significantly facing a threat because of climate change, because of greenhouse gas emissions. And if we don't control the greenhouse gas emissions, the future is going to be very, very dangerous, very, very precarious to say the least. And this was presented during the year 1990-91. So in 1992, that marked 20 years. 20 years. So in 1992, as a result of that IPCC assessment report and to commemorate 20 years of Stockholm, you had the Earth Summit at Rio. 
at Rio. Now it is at this place that three documents were finalized the forest conservation, sustainable use and agenda 21 and it is here that three conventions were arrived at convention to biological diversity, United Nations framework convention to combat desertification and also United Nations framework convention on climate change rather. So these conventions were arrived at. Then after that 1997 you had the third conference of parties to UNFCCC that is where Kyoto Protocol was arrived at. This Kyoto Protocol initially was supposed to be in action till 2012. Later on, as per the amendment, it was extended up till 2020. In order to finalize what needs to be done after 2020, in 2015, you had the uh, before 2015, we talk about twenty twelve because in twenty twelve you had twenty years of Rio summit. So here Rio plus twenty was celebrated, and it is here where sustainable development goals were discussed. Sustainable development goals were finally adopted in 2015. Then in 2015, at the 21st Conference of Party to UNFCCC, you had the Paris Agreement which was finalized. Okay, the Paris Agreement was finalized. As a result of this Earth Summit, GEF, Global Environment Facility, was set up. As a result of the Stockholm Conference, UNEP, United Nations Environment Program, that was set up. In the meanwhile, in this duration, you had national laws and national legislation to adhere to the requirements of the Stockholm. So that is when national laws were also passed in. So you had the first of them in 1972 you had the Wildlife Act, Wildlife Protection Act. Then in 1974 you had the setting up of Water Act, Protection of Pollution. It is under this act that you had the establishment of CPCB, Central Pollution Control Board. Then in 1980, you had the setting up of the Forest Act. Then in 1981, the scope of CPCB was further increased and augmented and enhanced to control the air pollution as well. That is when Air Act was passed. Then in 1986, you had the Environment Act which was passed. It was a kind of an umbrella legislation to provide legislation and conservation to the entirety of the environment. So this is in a concise manner the compilation of majority of the climate based action that you will come across and the nature based action that you will come across. If you refer to this and if you uh, always follow this kind of a timeline, it will be very easy for you to be able to solve any kind of question which is framed from here because majority of the candidates we face an issue in the sense that we are unable to understand when to think or which body has been set up under what mechanism. So that is where this will come in handy and obviously you can augment it in various methods for example you can talk about for example in 1985 in the meanwhile you had the Vienna Convention on ozone depletion 
and that Vienna Convention was further supplemented in 1987 by the Montreal Protocol in 2016. You had the Kigali Amendment to Montreal Protocol, Kigali uh, Amendment to Montreal, okay. So this kind of a pattern can be used, okay. This is going to help you significantly in terms of examination as well. CBD and CCD, so Convention to Combat Desertification, their conference of parties are held again just like CBD every two to three years. So here in CBD and CCD, in both of them we have around 15 conference of parties which have been held as of now. Sites, 19 conference of parties, UNFCCC, here you have had 27th conference of parties which was held in Egypt, Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt in 2022. This is where COP is held annually. Annually. In rest of the cases, it is not held annually. So the next conference of parties to UNFCCC is going to be held where? When you think about it, where is it going to be held? Very good. It is going to be held in Dubai. So 28 COP will be held in Dubai. Okay. That is in 2023. Okay. Now, moving on to the next question. In the context of the IPCC releasing the latest sixth assessment report, consider the following statements. Assessment report is a single detailed document released every few years by the IPCC in order to indicate the changes due to global warming. Assessment Report 6 or AR6 has indicated the need for the world to be carbon negative from 2050 onwards. Then IPCC was formed in 1988 by the World Meteorological Organization and United Nations Environment Program. Which of the following statements is or are correct here. So here take 20 seconds. Rio plus 20 is not Montreal. No. Rio plus 20 was held in 2012 in Rio itself and that is where SDGs were discussed. So in this the first statement. Assessment report is a single detailed document. That is incorrect. Because when we talk about assessment report, it is a combination of many different documents. You have the synthesis report which has been released right now. Because I hope we are aware that IPCC has got various working groups. It has got three working groups. All of them, they release their individual reports. So as per AR6, the initial report was generated in 2021. And that was about the physics or the science behind climate change. Then the second report which was generated last year that talked about the impact of climate change. And then eventually the synthesis report for AR6 has been released now. So here also when we talked about the IPCC and the first assessment report, remember I told you that it was in 1990 and 91 where the reports were presented. So the first statement is incorrect. Now then AR6 has indicated the need for the world to be carbon negative. That is correct. Why? Carbon negative means what? Carbon negative means you absorb much more or you sequester much more than what is produced overall. Okay. Now, IPCC was formed in 1988 by WMO and UNEP. That is going to be correct. So here, which of them are correct? So you will have C, that is 2 and 3 only, which is going to be the correct answer. Good to see majority of you have given the correct answer in this. Now, with reference to the Global Methane Pledge, consider the following statements. It is an initiative launched by the United States and the European Union. More than 100 countries have become a part of this, including India. The aim is to collectively reduce methane emissions by 30% of 2022 levels by 2030. Which of them are correct? Now global methane pledge, just to give you a brief background about it, this methane pledge was launched where? 
at conference of parties 26 to UNFCCC which was held in Glasgow okay now let's analyze the statements it is an initiative launched by United States and European Union absolutely correct then more than 100 countries have become a part of it that is correct including India this is incorrect India is not a part of this methane pledge as of now India is not a part of it then the aim is to collectively reduce methane emissions by 30% of 2022 levels by 2030 so here think about it this global methane pledge was arrived at in 2021 so ideally when they will set a goal they will set a goal for a from a prior date so that is why it is 30% of 2020 levels by 2030 so this is incorrect so which of them is or are correct so here the correct answer is D that is going to be one only okay again good to see majority I have given the correct answer now a direct kind of question which is oftentimes asked from the portion of environment adaptation gap report is released by which of the following organizations IPCC that is intergovernmental panel on climate change world wildlife fund United Nations environment program and global environment facility now that you have looked at the background of the various organizations I hope it will be much easier for you to talk about which particular body or which particular organization is at what role so this is a report which is generated by UNEP what is this report about is basically it talks about the condition that what is the requirement which needs to be done in order to mitigate and in order to adapt to climate change because we need to significantly provide funding mechanism at the same time we also need to reduce the emissions so here this report talks about requirement of funding and it tells us that the require the funding is not readily me being made available to the countries which require it so requirement of funding and also reduction of emission because this report also highlights the fact that as per the INDC that is the what is INDC UPSC has asked a question from INDC earlier INDC is intended nationally determined contribution which the various countries declare as per the Paris agreement so this report highlights that if all the countries first of all they are not able to achieve INDCs that they have set for themselves and even if they adhere to this INDC by the year 2100 we are looking at a temperature rise of more than 2 degrees Celsius so that is why this report gives a damning evidence of how more needs to be done and this is where when we talk about the funding mechanism the ball is put in the court of the developed nations where it is clearly highlighted that they have gone back upon their promises that they have been holding up ever since the Kyoto Protocol Paris Agreement and so on that funding is not available then consider the following statements about methane alert and response system or Mars now UNEP's International Methane Emission Observatory launched the system at Conference of Parties 27 to UNFCCC. It seeks the usage of Earth observation satellites for monitoring of methane emission. The International Energy Agency along with Climate and Clean Air Coalition are the partners in launching the system. What do you think is the correct answer? Uh, NDC or INDC both are same yes both of them are absolutely same so here in this case first one UNEP's IMEO that has launched the system at conference of parties 27 to UNFCCC that is correct it seeks the usage of earth observation satellites now methane emission methane alert and response system think about it methane alert how will you get an alert 
about how much methane is being released. You cannot rely upon the countries reporting them, them themselves that this much methane is being released from the farm sector, from the energy sector, etc. So you will need the requirement of making use of the earth observation satellites as well and that will be your alert then you will generate a response in terms of governmental measures and so on so this is also correct then the international energy agency along with climate and clean air coalition they are also the partners which have been brought in to bring about a better utility of this response system so in this c 1 2 and 3 are correct okay so here again good majority of you have got it correct so here again if you take a look at the four components of the mars or the methane alert and response system first of all you will observe that this talks about detection of methane detection that where it is being released in what quantity it is being released and that is where you will find the usage of various satellites for example Copernicus Sentinel satellite of European Union so all of that will be made use of and then the individual stakeholders will be notified they will be alerted that from your region this much methane is being emitted do something in order to mitigate that and then you will have response in terms of various measures policy actions etc and then eventually monitoring that if there has been a significant reduction which has been observed or is this all a kind of a step in futility so alert detect alert response and tracking these are the major fundamentals involved here so that has been launched on the sidelines of COP27 so in COP26 you had global methane pledge and 27 you have this Mars then which of the following can be used to best describe the conditions of eutrophication it is only observed in polluted lakes and ponds dumping of untreated sewage in the water body can give rise to eutrophication the water body is devoid of all nutrients as a result of eutrophication the biological oxygen demand of the water body experiences a sharp decline which of these is used for or is referring to eutrophication what is the main natural source of methane emission so methane emission the major natural source is from agricultural activities the enteric fermentation which is carried out in the milch and the cattles in general that produces a lot of methane then decomposition process wetlands paddy cultivation all of that is basically generating methane so let us take a look at the options it is only observed in polluted lakes and ponds so here this is incorrect why it can be sometimes observed even in marine areas sometimes even in the river streams where the flow has been inhibited there also eutrophication can be observed remember the very famous case of red tides which are generated in the region of florida now those red tides they are developed across the entire estuarine network in florida and that is again due to eutrophication so eutrophication can happen then dumping of untreated sewage in the water body can give rise to eutrophication absolutely correct because when you have untreated sewage it enriches the water body with phosphate phosphates and nitrates okay and this basically can give rise to the harmful algal bloom harmful algal bloom so the second statement is correct the third statement water body is devoid of all nutrients this is incorrect why because when you have eutrophication eutrophication in the simplest of terms mean that there is an overloading of nutrients rather than getting devoid of nutrients so third is incorrect fourth biological oxygen demand of the water body experiences a sharp decline this is also going to be incorrect because the bod 
is going to increase. BOD exponentially increases. Why? It exponentially increases. So if you observe here in this situation, when we talk about eutrophication, so you have a water body which is enriched with nutrients. Eutrophication. And understand the aspect and chronology of it once and for all. Okay, it is surprising that in this case majority of you gave the incorrect uh, or correct answer. Very good. I thought incorrect. Now, eutrophication here means overloading with nutrients right now as a result of that what happens is harmful algal bloom or HAB which is initiated that is when the entire region is covered by a greenish film or a reddish tinge depending upon what kind of algal bloom is being observed now these algae they are not immortals they will die as well now when they die, they will basically be deposited at the base. At the same time, when this algal bloom happens, they spread over the entire film or the surface of water. So in that manner, what they do is, they block sunlight. Sunlight for other aquatic plants. Reducing the production, reducing the oxygen generated. Then after that, here, less oxygen generated. Then this harmful algal bloom also means greater decomposition by aerobic bacteria. Aerobic means they make use of oxygen aerobic microbes now they are using oxygen means water gets devoid of oxygen or water turns hypoxic and when the water turns hypoxic that means the entire region gets converted into a dead zone water body gets converted to a dead zone meaning it can no longer support life that is why many of the times you would have come across newspaper headlines and articles and images indicating various different ponds and lakes in our cities suddenly populated with dead fishes on the surface suddenly you have 100 150 dead fishes floating on the surface that is a result of eutrophication leading to harmful algal bloom leading to the entire oxygen content being consumed by the organisms which decompose these dead algae and that is what turns the water body into a dead zone now here you have to understand what is bod and cod BOD or the biological oxygen demand is the total amount of oxygen required in the water body in order to decompose the organic components. And when we talk about the COD or chemical oxygen demand, it talks about the total oxygen required in order to decompose both organic as well as inorganic components. Always you will find that chemical oxygen demand chemical oxygen demand is always going to be greater as compared to biological oxygen demand okay it is always going to be greater why because if you consider the total amount of waste in the water body it will always include both organic and inorganic and that is when COD gives you a correct picture. Okay? Then, consider the following statements about cryomesh technology recently in news. Now, cryomesh is associated with the aspect of corals. So, it provides a boost for the growth of corals, ensuring a quick development of reefs. They can be helpful in preserving the genetic diversity of corals. 
This was implemented successfully in the Gulf of Kutch region to ensure sustainability of coral reefs. So which of them they talk about cryo mesh? So the first statement, it provides a boost for the growth of corals ensuring a quick development of reefs. That is not the purpose of cryo mesh. What is the purpose of cryo mesh? Cryo mesh is basically designed in order to preserve the genetic diversity of the corals. And recently, this is where it has been implemented in the region of Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Where the Great Barrier Reef for the past few years has gone through four or multiple different phases of bleaching activities. Due to La Nina conditions where you have warmer waters in the region of Western Pacific, that is what has led to significant amount of bleaching in those areas. So when you have bleaching, let's say the conditions revert, the corals can come back to life, the corals can repopulate the area, but the genetic diversity in those corals, that will be impacted. Because genetic diversity is very important for the sustainability of any species in general. So that is why the larvae or the larval stages of the corals, they are basically frozen on this cryo mesh to be reintroduced in order to ensure the maintenance of genetic diversity. And this is done in a easier and a practical manner. That is why it is considered to be a kind of a breakthrough. So they can be helpful in preserving genetic diversity of corals. Absolutely correct. This was implemented successfully in the Gulf of Kutch to ensure sustainability of coral reefs. Incorrect. This was implemented in the region of Great Barrier Reef of the coast of Australia. So in this, which of them are correct? So the correct answer is going to be D. That is only. How to reduce uh, eutrophication? Canon eutrophication basically can be reduced by controlling the pollution, by ensuring the removal of excess sedimentary deposits at the base of the lakes or the water bodies, whichever is uh, uh, suffering from eutrophication. So removal of excessive amount of sediments and also controlling the emission of effluents in the water body, they can control that eutrophication. Now, with regards to deforestation, consider the following statements. It is the second biggest source of anthropogenic emission of carbon in the atmosphere. It leads to a significant loss of biodiversity. Red Plus is an initiative of the UNFCCC to reduce emissions from deforestation in developing countries which of the above statements is or are correct. So here, it is the second biggest source of anthropogenic emission when we talk about deforestation. What is it? Removal of forest from a particular area, cutting down of trees from a forested region, which is already forested. So this forest or these trees, they store significant amount of carbon and carbon compounds. They are the natural green sinks of the carbon in the atmosphere they are stored and the atmospheric carbon dioxide is trapped and retained by these particular species in general. So here when you cut that tree all that stored carbon is immediately released. So this is going to be correct. After the energy sector this is one of the biggest source of anthropogenic emissions. It leads to significant loss of biodiversity. Obviously, when you carry out deforestation, the biodiversity loss will also be very apparent because the fragmentation of habitat will happen. Now, third, Red Plus is an initiative of UNFCCC. What is Red Plus? Red Plus, basically it stands for reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation of forest. Right? So reducing emissions. So how do you do that? You incentivize, you make the local population a stakeholder in ensuring protection so that the forest produce, the forest rights are given to the local people so that they will not have an incentive in cutting the trees. Now this is an initiative strongly advocated by countries like India and India has sought to reduce the emissions from the developing countries by this mechanism itself. Now this Red Plus mechanism was an initiative of 
COP19 to UNFCCC which was held in 2013 in Warsaw Poland that is where this is sometimes also referred to as the Warsaw Convention or sometimes the Warsaw Agreement but Warsaw Agreement is used for multiple different things of geopolitics as well. So red plus is an outcome of UNF triple C. So that is again correct. So here in this case the correct statement is going to be 1, 2 and 3. All of them are going to be correct. Okay. Now after this consider the following statements with reference to blue flag certification. Maharashtra is the only coastal state in India with no blue flag certified beaches. The certification is provided annually by Foundation for Environmental Education. Spain has the largest number of blue flag certified beaches across the world. So here which of them are incorrect that is what we have to find out now blue flag certification is provided for sustainable management of the beaches proper waste segregation educational awareness inculcation amongst the people for sustainable utility of the coastal landscape ensuring that waste is not disposed of or dumped into the water body ensuring that unsustainable fishing activities such as bottom trawling is not carried out so for these purposes blue flag certification is provided as of now in india how many blue flag certification uh, certified beaches do we have we have around 12 blue flag certified beaches latest of them is the Thundi beach and the Kadmat beach of Lakshadweep which have been given this certificate that is why this has been in news now if we take a look at it then Maharashtra is the only coastal state in India with no blue flag certified beaches this is incorrect which is the other state which doesn't have any kind of blue flag certified beaches the other state is West Bengal. West Bengal is a, a coastal state in the country which doesn't have the blue flag certified beaches along with Goa. They also don't have any blue flag certified beaches. Then the certificate is provided annually by FEE. That is correct. Spain has the largest number of blue flag certified beaches in the world. This is also going to be correct. Overall, you have more than 4,000 blue flag certified beaches across the entirety of the world. So which of them are incorrect? You have the answer that is A. That is one only. That is incorrect. Okay. Now these are the beaches which have been provided with the uh, blue flag certificates. Ideally, these are only 12 in number. You should not have any difficulty in knowing that. Now, uh, what is bottom trawling? It is not trolling. It is trawling. So, bottom trawling is a kind of a fishing activity where you attach a net which is fixated to the boat and that net scrapes the ocean floor or the sea floor in order to take care of any kind of fishes, vegetation, etc. which can be extracted in the process. Now that is very unsustainable and leads to significant amount of uprooting of the individual coral polyps, gives rise to coral bleaching in that region and also muddies the water significantly, destroying the pristine habitat and the much fragile habitat for many of the marine species. That is bottom trawling. Okay. So that is where we'll restrict the session here for today. Tomorrow when we get together again, we shall be initiating the discussion from here on. And tomorrow we shall be focusing upon the prominent protected areas which have been in news. And we shall be taking up questions from that aspect. And day after tomorrow, we shall be moving on to the species oriented discussion. So that is all from my side. I hope that today's discussion has been helpful to you. How many questions you have got correct or incorrect? Please let us know in the comment section. If you like the video, don't forget to click on the like, share and the subscribe button. So till we meet again tomorrow, take care of yourself. Goodbye and have a good night.